that changes are that not happen again because we go in different directions 
And I've always thought Jim Walker was one of the smartest men I in the Lord's work. Deep thing. He was in school. I had classes with him and he was rather intimidating uh, with the grades he made. And I got by by the grace of God. But as we were saying goodbye today, knowing that we may never be like that again, I mean, we could, but it's really not that likely. Uh, Jimmy said this. He said, since there's no night in heaven, that means there's no tomorrow. He said, if you think about it, you got to have a night before you have it tomorrow. And he said, so everybody, all of us here, are going to arrive in heaven the same day. And uh, whichever one of us get there first, uh, they'll say, well, the others will be here in a few minutes. Don't you love that? Did I spell it right, Pat? And he said, that's true with our loved ones. Think, think of those that have gone on. When I think about those who are not with us anymore, they're at Oakdale. Um, we'll get to the same day, maybe. And uh, they're saying, while well, Lou and Patsy be here in a few minutes. I love that. Well, that's enough of that. I just want to show that with you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. You and quite a few other people for the opportunity to do mission work. Patrick uh, and I left the located ministry, which I loved. I, I was never unhappy of being, being a preacher in church like Dean is. But I, I felt God calling me to a different kind of ministry. And so we left the located ministry in 1974. You can figure that out if you want to. Uh, Jimmy and Dick uh, got me thinking, here they are retired, and I'm older than they are. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, I love what I do, Patsy and I love what we're doing. But I left the located ministry to work in America in Revival Week. And, and we've had uh, 34 states that we've traveled in and 17 foreign countries. And I long ago passed the 1,000 mark in the number of Revival meetings. And in the early days, those were two week meetings, right? A two week meeting in, when you came to the Lord and Revival. But, but as wonderful as that is, and I've got uh, three or four more. My last one at this year at McConnellsville, Ohio, and I had no idea where that was, and I saw a sign out of 22 that said McConnellsville. And when I leave there, uh, November 1st, uh, I go back to Liberia in West Africa, where there is a tremendous turning to God. We, we passed the 2,000 some mark in the number of Liberians that we've had the privilege of baptizing in Christ. And we don't lose those. They're staying in the church and the church is growing. And with leaps and bounds, it's the only country that I've ever been in where people will meet you on the street and beg you for a Bible. Uh, they've gone through 
14 years of civil war and uh, 150,000 people were massacred in, in that country. So whatever we're going to do, we need to be busy doing it there. Tonight, I, I want to show with you, and I'll watch the clock so that I don't keep you too long right now. But I want to share with you what we're doing in, in three nations. Maybe more than that on here, but I'll stop at three. And probably the smart way to begin this one is to let Patrick share it. Would you do that, honey? This is Bulgaria in Eastern Europe. And oftentimes have people ask, how in the world did you get to Bulgaria? Bulgaria is across the Danube River from Romania. I didn't know anybody in Bulgaria, uh, but God wanted us to go there, and we did. And Patsy is really, was really the key to Bulgaria. Would you tell them about how this came about? Uh, a year ago, we were in Liberia. We were in Liberia, and um, I met a woman there that I had never met before, and her name was Barbara Garber. And Barbara is a sister to uh, Reggie Thomas. On the left. And she's the white haired woman here on the left. And she and I worked together in uh, teaching women and children in Liberia. And um, I, I had a great time with her. She came home and went out. West, where she lived, and I went back to Virginia. And a couple of months later, I got a telephone call from her. And she said, Patsy, I feel a burden to go to Bulgaria. Will you go with me? And I said, Sure, I'll go. I don't know where it is or what we'll do, but I'll go with you. And she said, Well, we need to teach women and children in Bulgaria. And she said, They just need some encouragement. This is a former communist country, and so the people are very depressed. And they're rather persecuted if they're a Christian because of the, the Orthodox um, church that they have there. And they don't really teach about Christ. It's all, um, um, what do you call it, the uh, great uh, ritual stuff. They go through all this ritual stuff while they're there. And um, so I was real excited about it. And she said, I don't think it's going to be safe for two women to go. By themselves. She said, Would you ask Lewis if he'll go with you? So <laughs> I said, Well, what will Lewis do? And she said, Well, I, I, I can assure you, he will preach at this little church we're going to. And uh, she said, Probably what he'll do is just babysit us. <laughs> <laughs> so he went with us. And what we did was meet with a small church that was there, a very small church that met in a storefront because they could not um, meet openly without being persecuted. They carried their Bibles in a bag. If they, if they did, they, uh, they didn't want anyone to know that they were carrying their Bible because they might be scorned. And uh, I went to this lady's house. This is doing something I don't want to do. No, this is probably rubbing against something. Okay. Uh, we went to this lady's house who was Christian. And um, she invited us to come to her home because her husband was not a Christian. And uh, so we took Lewis with us, and he was able to talk with this man and witness to him about Christ. He had been a uh, soldier in the, in the uh, Communist uh, Party in Russia. And um, he came out there and moved to Bulgaria. And um, so we were, we were tickled to get to, to witness to him. And Lewis got to talk to him about Christ and um, him being a um, thank you. I watched this from Paul and Francis. <laughs> you can go on. Um, uh, Stevelina was her name, and she spoke some English. And we were very fortunate that many of the people in the church did speak some English because they teach English in the, in the high school there. And many people take English, hoping to get out of the country somewhere. And they had a big celebration and reenacted some wars that happened years and years ago. 
and liver ecosystem that can go on to that. This is how we met with the women. We would meet with them in a home, and they would invite their neighbors to come in. And so we got to witness to some people who were not Christians. And uh, this lady in the dark shirt is the preacher's wife. And she speaks English. Her husband is an American, and she's Bulgarian. And they have two children. Her husband went there to work with the college as a, a counselor. And he was very discouraged because while he was in the college, he could convert people to Christianity. But after they got out of college, they went back into the world. And so he thought he would stay there and try to start a church. And uh, he became an uh, English teacher in the high school. I think it was a ninth grader. He taught. He was teaching English, and in this class at the school, um, everybody spoke English. They did not speak any Bulgarian. So he invited Lewis and Barbara and I to come to the school. You can flip on through some of these that, um, that well, we did crafts, and we had a class. Sure. We did crafts. This is in the church, and it's just a storefront, and uh, they have a little sign that calls them, they call themselves the Good News Church. And they just put scripture up, and that's all. And uh, this is children. I taught these children in Sunday school. And then in the home, we would have a little class with the children uh, when we met. Um, that was during the Sunday school. Uh, going to, uh, Barbara is the one in the white dress. Alina, we had never met her, but she had had some communication with Reggie Thomas. And this is why Barbara wanted to go there, because she felt a great need to to try to bring Christ to these people, and most of them in that church were women. And uh, we had a, a fun day on uh, a Saturday, and the preacher's wife said, I'm really afraid to do this because we may find, find some people who will be uh, unhappy about us being there, and they may step in and try to stir up some trouble. And we <laughs> found <laughs> working hard. Working hard. <laughs> We found out okay. this uh, cell phone. <laughs> we found out that this big celebration was going on at the stadium. And so the park was fairly empty. So we took all the children to the park. And we, there were a few people there. And we invited their children to come and join us. And after that celebration with the children, the fun games and the classes and the crafts, we took a whole day. Uh, these women brought their children. And they were in church the next Sunday, uh, the ones that we invited at the park. And so that was really exciting to us that we got to witness to them and invite them to the church. And they came. That's just some of the children getting ready for some games. Another class that we had, this woman in the white was just a neighbor, and she came and joined in with us. Okay. Uh, Barbara Barber and Alina's mother. Alina spoke English, and uh, her life was a very long story, and I won't go into that. But she was a Christian, and she came from Macedonia to Bulgaria because of some persecution she had, and she had to leave her husband because he was um, abusive to her. And so she's now in Bulgaria. She has uh, an apartment there, and she's the one we stay in communication with and try to encourage her to remain faithful to the Lord, and she has Bible classes in her home. Um, some of the ruins in Bulgaria. Can I tell about those? Yeah, this is one that needs to finish. What, what we're looking at here is a back street. Uh, this, by the way, is old Thessalonica. And uh, you can imagine the preaching that went on there. Thank you. Preaching that went on there uh, all those years ago. And now no church. Uh, there, there is not in all of Bulgaria, unless you would call Good News Church one of them, a New Testament church. These people believe just like we do as far as who Jesus is. They believe it's necessary to uh, repent of their sin. They baptize in the Danube River for the forgiveness of sins. And they take the Lord's Supper only once a month. And I was able to teach them concerning that. Some were convinced, some were not convinced. 
But we're going to stay in touch with this church in Bulgaria. Uh, you can stand and look over into Romania. And I, I pray that God would open the door for me to go into Romania and, and preach the gospel. I don't know how many of you have heard the story of the Lutheran minister, Richard Bornbrack. If you've never read that, you, you won't agree with all the doctrine, but you need to read the story. He spent 14 years in solitary confinement in Romania. And it made chills on me, uh, run over me to stand and look across that beautiful river in the Romania and to know how those people suffered and died under communism. And I pray that God, before I die, would open the door for me to go there. That's Romania, because you can see across the Yes, that's the Danube, and across the river is the country of Romania. These communist block countries, where, where I'm standing now and taking that picture, is Bulgaria, and once communism collapsed, nobody went there to evangelize. None of my people went to that uh, wide open country. So the country is now governed by the mafia. And uh, it's very ruthless. Uh, people disappear. Uh, if they do something to oppose them, they just vanish. And they use the same tactics that the mafia operate operated in this country. Uh, some more shots of this uh, visiting uh, here, Barbara. Oh, this is uh, we were invited to come and speak to the high school. And uh, they, they speak English. This was in English class. And the teacher said, please do not mention God or the Bible. And he said, if you do, I'm going to lose my job, and who knows what else. So I said, why are we going? I don't want to uh, go all the way to Bulgaria and talk about Niagara Falls or talk about uh, Grand Canyon. Well, when we got in the French room, the kids just wanted to know about America. Tell us about that great country of Paris. And Patch and I were wondering, back up one. Yeah, Patch and I were wondering how we could approach them. And, and Patch was a smart one in dealing with this. They had just finished C.S. Lewis's book, uh, The Witch the Lion and the Wardrobe. Witch the Lion and the Wardrobe, whatever the title is. And I had read the book. Patch had not read the book, but I think you saw the movie. And so she had all these beautiful teenagers. And Patrick just took them to class. And she, the teacher said, maybe uh, these visitors from America will help you write your book report or your report on this book. And so Patrick said, well, what do you want to know about? It? And they were quiet. So she began probing a little bit, and uh, you tell them, honey. You don't need to write. I asked them if they knew what this all meant, and they said yes. I said, well, what does the witch represent? And they said, um, evil. And I said, I know evil, but what evil? And they said, evil, just bad, evil. And I said, well, put a name to it. And they said, just evil. And I said, well, what about Satan? Yeah, it could be Satan. It could be Satan. I said, well, what does the lion represent? And have any, are you familiar with this story about the lion, the witch, and the water? Well, it's a, a book by C.S. Lewis, and it's, it's a fiction thing, but it's about a lion that dies for everybody, not just good people or evil people. And the witch is always trying to get everybody to be evil. So they didn't know anything about how this was related to the scripture. So I said, well, what does the lion represent, which was supposed to represent Jesus? And they said, goodness. 
I said, yes, it represents goodness, but what kind of goodness? Just goodness. And I said, well, spiritually, what kind of goodness? And they still didn't have any idea what I was talking about. I said, what about Jesus? And one boy said, well, yeah, it, it could be Jesus. And I said, so evil represents the devil, and goodness represents Jesus. And they kind of not yeah, that, that might be right. And so after the class, we asked the teacher, who was the preacher of the church, I said, do you think us talking about Jesus and, and this, do you think that got you in trouble? He said, no, I think it went right over their head. But I don't think so. It did not. I, think it was, I think they realized that you could have Jesus and Satan goodness. And While Patsy was doing her teaching, the teacher's knees were not. Uh, but we had a defense uh, in that all we were doing was answering the kids' questions. But both aren't they beautiful children? They have been raised not to believe in God. Not just one or two of them. Yeah, all of them. And, and I hate to say this. One of them said it. We see the same pattern in our country all the time that we watch happen in the park. They have no Bible. The Bible, the Bible, they used to be Bibles in the school, but they removed all reference to God or Jesus or prayer or anything. And church, church became rich. It has nothing to do with God, and especially Jesus. And these beautiful children, I just I just want to hug them all. They were so responsive and so interested in knowing and passing at them, eating out of their hands. And I don't know what will happen. And we've got a standing invitation to go back. They begged us to come back to Bulgaria and to help them. And I'd like to think that that work will become a strong, about 30 of them in the church. And that could be a wonderful move for us. And I, I want you to hear about that and we run out of time. Next month. Oh, this is Patsy, and you need to back up one too. This is where we were forced to live for 20 years. <laughs> Isn't that horrible? <laughs> we lived in a little apartment, and you can see this. From our front porch. Beautiful Grand Am Beach, and we would oftentimes begin our morning uh, uh, walking, running, back when I could run, on this three mile beach. Uh, we'd uh, get our exercise, swim a little bit, and go home and start our day. This is in Grenada uh, in the West End Beach. Next slide. Uh, we discovered something recently that has really been a joy. When we first went down in 20 years ago, we both became ham radio operators. And we carried an app the radio, our radio down. And our communication was with our son, Doug. And then he would call everybody or make phone passes so we could talk to our other children. Well, by and by, we got a computer. There were no computers there. So we had email. And now the latest thing, Patsy Ball, a magic jack. Anybody got one of those? How much you pay for that? $19. $19 to plug it in the computer. For an entire year, you can call anybody in the world. Anytime, day or night. And it's clearer than if you held up the telephone. And then she uses the headphones and she's talking to one of the kids and somebody in this next. Uh, ordination service. Uh, this young man uh, married with a couple of children was recently ordained as a deacon. Uh, I don't ordinarily do any baptizing. Uh, because I would rather that they uh, identify with their own people. 
Grenada is a black nation, as in as is Africa, a black continent for the most part. But this young man was very special. I've known him since he was an infant, and uh, he and I have been very close. And when time came for him to become a Christian, he asked me if I would do it, and and of course I was happy to do so. A uh, beautiful back street. Uh, this is a uh, a uh, beautiful uh, Caribbean Sea. All right. He is receiving his baptismal speaking. Next one. Just some of our kids. Uh, we, have, we have a beautiful situation in Grenada. And it's like this they are colorblind, and so are we. That's how they only white people uh, among this. And they, they can't even look at us and tell uh, That's just never been a problem. And uh, we, we treated Roy and my people. This was in the, in a church service in January where we had a record attendance of 105. And it's taken 20 years uh, to reach this. We'll get up, uh, like church here in America, uh, we'll get up to 80 or 90. And somebody will get the red licked off the cake, and they'll get mad and quit. You don't have that here do you? in America. And we'll go back down to 50, and then we'll be about 80, and then somebody's name will not be mentioned. They donated flowers, and so they get mad and quit. It's not quite that bad, but it's almost bad. But we've now got the premium crop. Uh, we don't have any padded views. Uh, we have some old benches made out of oak. A guy in Virginia gave us this set of drums, and if I could have killed him, I would. <laughs> <laughs> when, when you see a lady play a drum, from the game play a drum, and it'll drive you out of there. But anyway, that's their church, and I don't. Tell them how they are to worship as long as they follow the spirit. Uh, I get to preach once in a while, for you, but not all. Yeah. Uh, three, three men that we met and taught and baptized and trained, we spoon fed them over a period of about seven years. And ordain them as evangelists. They're not pastors, they're not ministers, they're evangelists. And uh, they're, they're doing the guy in the middle, Bessie uh, and Dino, uh, the other white guy here, he's not there anymore. Uh, this is Jill Newman, who came from the church for Dick McBride, he's preached. At Lost Ohio. And Jim and his wife Becky are now in Australia. And they're doing great work. And Patrick and I go down there on occasionally and, and work with them. But he's done great work. It's more about children. Our greatest treasure in Grenada are children. Uh, these children are being raised. In a home where the Bible is read, and their, their parents were not. So they're going to make a difference. They're growing up singing all the little songs about Jesus, doing the work of God. Uh, pray for this little girl, Sharika. Please do. Sharika is 14, 14 years old. She's got sickle cell of and she's not going to live, and she knows that. Uh, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, she was about to die. And so, but she's a dear child. If I could bring her to America and adopt her, she's not an adoption, but I'd take her to heartbeat. She loves me like an old grandpa. And, uh, well, this Liberia, 
Uh, Liberia is a beautiful country. It was established by three slaves in 1841-1822, and most of them came from people who were slaves in America. And so we got in Liberia uh, sections known as Virginia and Georgia and, uh, and some of those names. They eat the food that was eaten in the South that I grew up on colleges, black-eyed beans, all that good stuff. Uh, population is three and a half million. Uh, guess what? They speak English. I've never thought it was very effective to work in a country where I had to use someone to translate. And so they speak English. 40% of them Christian, quote unquote. That means anybody that believes in God, I guess. Only 20% Islam, 40% Bible, with a life life expectancy of about 42 years. You don't live to get old in that country. They are amazed that Patrick and I can come over there at our age. I have to tell you this, if I don't have any time left. I preached one night to 700 people, all of them standing, uh, last year. No words And when I got up to preach, the African preacher said to that huge audience, this old man amazes me. <laughs> he said, he's an old man. And he's been out fishing all day. And here he is, ready to preach. Patsy sitting there with me. She said, he, he's so old, he ought to be somewhere laying down. <laughs> and here he is. So after we get back home, Patsy had some jobs for me to do. And I said, honey, I'm an old man. I should be somewhere laying down. <laughs> That didn't help. <laughs> uh, this team that went with us, some of you may know some of these people. There's a couple, a Glenn from Chinese Mountain, uh, out in Oklahoma. Uh, Brother Reggie Thomas is up to the top, standing next to me over there, 82 years old, and going strong uh, all over the world. Uh, uh, Barbara, of course, is with it. This beautiful young girl in the front row is a single girl looking for a husband. Well, I, she, she would like that husband. But she's a professional Christian singer. She lives in Indianapolis and sings all over the world. But these people made a great tea. And uh, on this trip, trip, we baptized 992 people. Christ. All of us stood up and took the city of Monrovia and had 14 revival meetings going on simultaneously. And uh, we'd come back each night and report what God had done. I, I got up one morning and I said, I want to tell you that God blessed Pat and I last night. Uh, we baptized. 19 people in chicken soup. <laughs> and they all go looking around. I said, that's right. We baptized 19 people last night in chicken soup. Chicken soup was the name of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> <ain't my> <laughs> I always enjoy that. <laughs> This is my partner. I, I don't blush to say it, but uh, Patsy, other than God saving me, Patsy's the best thing that happened. <laughs> and, uh, if, uh, if I told her tonight that uh, God needed me uh, in Istanbul, Turkey, uh, she'd start back. And that's not easy. 
That's a good way to go wherever I wanted to go with the God leading. And I can say it in front of her, I've never heard one complaint. I know there were times when we were in places we should have been in. Uh, no doubt about that. I appreciate it so much. Uh, next slide, that's report time. Uh, one of the churches where we preach, very few buildings, just meet outside uh, next to uh, I have to tell you this story. Well, I've already shared this. Uh, Dean made a whole lot of this. This is a guy that I met who asked me for a Bible. And I said, I'm sorry. I had $500, but I've given them all away. He said, How about that Bible? And I said, Well, that's my personal Bible. And I preached that. And he said, Well, can't you get another one? <laughs> That's why it gets good. And reluctantly, I parted with my chamber of the Bible with all my notes. Yeah. Really. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't see him for a year. And when I saw him again, he rushed up to me and said, Brother Hall, do you remember me? I said, no. And he said, I'm the guy that asked me that Bible. And he said, I wanted you to know that since you gave me the Bible, I gave my life to Christ and was baptized, given of sin, and I'm now preparing to be one of the preachers here, all because you got a Bible. And uh, you can't stop the Word of God. It truly is sharp. And then the two ends. Next one. And the next. Uh, we give the kids a few, few pennies, nickel, dime, whatever, for to carry water for our baptistry. Our baptistries are children's swimming pools. We carry those in if you can get 15 inches of water. You've got more than enough water to immerse a Liberian. They sit down in it, and you just throw them right back uh, in, into the water. And so that's, uh, Pat's is taking some pictures and uh, sharing them with the children there. Next one. Woman at the well. <laughs> and uh, I'll go on through these. Next one. Here is a uh, young man been baptized, gallows, yeah, and raised here. And uh, don't let anybody ever tell you that uh, you can't always find a place to immerse somebody. I've, I've done that in a therapy club in a hospital. The, you can make a way in, in Afghanistan right now. They're digging a pit and laying a canvas in it. And pull them full of water and immerse them. That's a weak argument uh, to say that you don't have to be immersed. You always find a place. Next one. Oh, I have to tell this story. That little boy, uh, that little boy saw me and began screaming. <laughs> and uh, I love children, and I just said, Hi, that little girl. He just, he just panicked. Can't you see the, the fear in his face? And his mother, sitting there beside him, said, I am so sorry that you are the first white man that he has ever seen. I said, don't worry about that, man. I said, the first time I saw a black man, I ran home and got into bed. And he <laughs> She loved that. She loved that. He just broke the tension, that, you know. But he soon warmed up to me. We have a guy in, uh, in Ashland, Kentucky. Every year when we leave, leave to go, he gives $1,000. And he said, buy $1,000 worth of 
with the rice bait and feed the children. You know how much rice you buy? A thousand dollars. A lot of rice. So, next one. These are some kids with a meal of rice and beans, uh, a meal that they might not have at all. And uh, I got back from my building, a guy said to me, and I'm ashamed to tell you that he's a preacher. He said, Well, Lou, how many rice Christians did you make? No, we don't give people anything to be baptized. But if you've got little children, hunger, and you've got food to give them, it's, it's worse than pagan not to feed them. And, uh, and uh, of course the Word of God, I've, I've quit turning in Bibles because I can buy them cheaper in Africa than I can carry them in, and I buy them by the case. And this is all those Bibles in one place in the boonies uh, where I'm preaching. Thank you. Would you love to see this in America? Yes. All over Liberia are signs that say Jesus is the leader of Liberia. Jesus is Lord over Liberia. Jesus, the King of Liberia. And Patrick it there to learn. And, and I just pray that that spirit among that government, they have a woman present. And she's a good friend. She's a spiritual lady and wants to lead that country uh, in the way of the Lord. Go ahead. And the next. So the worship, the worship is lively and uh, uh, they do a little dancing. But you ever see Grandma do that? She's going to jump up and do it. <laughs> That's where it gets with you. Uh, you don't have any problem with attendance. Uh, they just pour out and sit anywhere they find a place to sit. We're coming up on my favorite preacher. Just a few minutes here, next. And the next. That's how I believe this is one of your classes. And the next. Uh, what do you call this, Patrick? It's a gorgeous old sign. See the kids chewing on triple things. That's like the candy bar to them. Next one. Um, next one. And the next. Some of these are not the best. Fill in the bags for the end. Aren't these beautiful children? You know they are. Beautiful. Beautiful children. Next one. Actually, he's going to worship time. And, uh. Let's get him with it. <laughs> Did you know white men can't clap? Can't clap. Try to, can't clap. Actually, get him with it. Next one. I don't know. Oh, I love the food tonight. I'm okay with this, and I'm going to quit. Uh, one night, I knew you ever have this feeling that your audience wasn't with you. You ever preach, and, you, and I just, you know, if we're smart, we can tell that. And I know I've got 300 people, and it must have been my preaching because they just, there was a restlessness, and I thought I gotta do something. So I, I came down and got two little boys. Uh, this little boy and his brother, who was a little bit older. And I, I read them the story of the prodigal son. And this little boy was the young brother who left home. I sent him away, and Patsy took him over outside of the people. And I told how the older brother stayed home and worked, and how the young brother wasted his life, and finally decided to go home. And I said, he returned home, and I was the father. I said, his father saw him a long way off, and he ran and 
hugged him and kissed him. So I ran to the little boy, took him in my arms, and that huge audience began to applaud. And they clapped and clapped and clapped and cheered. And I was able to drive home the point that that's what God wants you to do. If you'll come home, he'll meet you and he'll love you and he'll accept you. And I think it was, I don't remember how many that night was. There were 20 some, and that's the most in the Yes. These are Muslim kids. And, uh, but, but a great number came. Adults came to give their life to Christ. Go ahead. Lots of baptism. Go ahead. Go ahead. Give my baptism certificate. Uh, offering time, I think. And this is. Yeah. As our friend from Indiana, her relative was saying. Go ahead, next one. And next. Go ahead. Small group. Next one. Kids, kids, kids. Preacher's wife and the preacher there. People with Bibles. Never had one before. Next. Next one. All right. Next. These just people that we come to love and know that are in the house. Yeah. I have struggled that this minute. Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures of all the pictures we made. That's an hour surrounded by these African people. And we feel so close to them. Many of these people in the audience, we had the joy of baptizing Christ. Can you pick us out? <laughs> you ought to be able to find us in this picture and the last slide. She said, Therefore, beseech the Lord of harvest, send that work to be taught. There's nothing great about me. And, and I'm not pious, and I'm not all that dedicated, but I can't retire as long as I'm able to do it. We're, we're, we're long ways from doing what the Lord said to do. Pray for the loss of our very and the thousands of new Christians as they serve the Lord now. Next time, if God permits a next time, I want to tell you about Tunisia in the north. 98% Muslim. No crosses, no churches, no Bible. 400 Christians among 11 million. The door is open. And we can go there. And it's not a safe place, but God takes care of his own. These great days to be alive and, and be on the fire line. Thank you for your mission help. Odell is our longest supporter by far. I have to give credit to the old timers here who began supporting our work years ago and continue to do so. We try to be good stewards and I hope we have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brother Lou and Patsy. We appreciate that so much. This picture here is a universal sign. I think we know what it means, don't we? This is the sign for surrender. The only way to win is to surrender. So as we pray for Romania and Liberia and Canada, Tunisia, I think it was the last two mentioned. We pray for America and 
get in the way of some of these countries who are now coming out of it. It appears we're going into it. But most importantly tonight, for those of you in our audience tonight, maybe there's someone here tonight who's ready to surrender, ready to come. Another song that we sing, Just As I Am, Thou Wilt Receive. Well, in order for him to receive us, we must first come to him. So we want to give that invitation to you tonight before we form our prayer service. So while we're still in our seats, we will stand for our final song tonight, this invitation. If we'd like to be received by God tonight, to become a Christian, to be buried with Christ in the waters of baptism, we invite you to come so you can be received. You can do that tonight if you'd like. We'd like to be the table. Oh, Jesus, I surrender all the dreams I really did. I
May we, Lord, who have partaken today of the body and blood of Christ, be that one body, with the one message and the one hope as we go forth this week. Give each one of us, Lord, your success and your victory and your peace tonight as we sleep. And Lord, should it be our final night, help us rest well, Lord, until our conscience is clear. If our conscience is not yet ready, Lord, may we uh, may we no longer delay. May we rise and be baptized, wash away our sins as we call in your name, and we gratefully accept the great gift that you give to us as we do that. We pray this and plead it not for ourselves only, but for those in Romania, Tunisia. We pray for those in Romania, Liberia. We pray for those in America. We pray for our own homes, Father, that we can put over our homes the sign of Jesus as King, Jesus as Leader, Jesus as Lord. We love you, God, and we thank you. Before we close, one last prayer for Sharika. Thank you for her acceptance of Christ in Lord Lindbergh. Travel, departure comes to receive her home safe and sound. You may her witness bring others to Jesus where she lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.